Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the research colloquium at Aspen University and United States University. This is a collaboration between the two where our faculty come together and are able to share some of their research. Um, and we have a very special speaker with us today, our keynote speaker, speaking of San Diego and pretty weather. Uh, we got Dr. Jennifer Billingsley, and you can see Jennifer's uh, presentation topic and slide here. Um, Jennifer comes with a wealth of background in nursing and is uh, published and a presenter on a regular basis. So um, we're excited to have her and, and to have her share what she's learned from some of her research about um, using a specific data decision making, uh, um, data driven de uh, uh, decision making model. Sorry about that. Um, but where she's using that in order to uh, sort of drive the culture more towards student um, success. Let me go on and turn it over to Jennifer. Sorry, I'm admitting people here a little bit simultaneously. Um, and get started, Jennifer. So the stage is yours. Great. Thank you so much. So welcome, everybody, to our inaugural biannual research colloquium presented by Aspen University and United States University. I'm really excited to be kicking off this event. I want to extend a special thank you to Dr. Kevin Thrasher for coordinating this colloquium. We have a full week of fantastic engaging speakers. The theme for this first day will focus on using these creative approaches to solve problems through scientific inquiry. As you can see, I will be speaking about creating a data informed decision making culture today. And Dr. Mina Beeman, the Dean for the School of Nursing and Health Sciences at Aspen University, will also be speaking a little later today about uh, forensic nursing in the public health pandemic. So please note all the microphones will be off during the presentation, but I really encourage you to use the chat function. So there is gonna be some interaction during this presentation and I uh, certainly encourage your participation with that. Um, there will also be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of the presentation. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, for the last two years, I have had the honor really to be the Dean and Professor for the College of Nursing of Health Sciences at USU. And I really started my nursing at uh, Arizona State University and received my bachelor's there in nursing. And that was in 2001. And as I was preparing this, I realized it has literally been 20 years since I've been in the field of nursing, starting as a certified nursing assistant all the way to a doctorate. So it's been quite the journey. And um, have experience as FNP director, DNP program chair, and I still am practicing as a mobile nurse practitioner. And it's essentially a primary care provider for older adults. Uh, in assisted living facilities and their homes. I definitely enjoy doing that as well. And my doctoral work focused on decreasing harmful medications in my beloved geriatric population. I've also lectured on bridging the gap between the elderly and community. I've worked in higher education for over 10 years now in various faculty, clinical preceptor roles, and uh, definitely these leadership roles are, are my favorite. And we, uh, my mission and vision is always to empower our students to reach their academic and professional goals. So you'll see that as part of the theme uh, of our presentation today. So I want you to pause for a moment and I want you to imagine that you are visiting me for your annual physical exam. It's already that time again, the year has passed and you need to get your annual exam. I'm taking your blood pressure and it reveals a reading of 152 over 90. As most of you know, that reading is a little high. In fact, we have specific evidence-based guidelines that detail a treatment plan recommended for any patient who has an elevated blood pressure. I would probably consider your age and consider any kind of comorbidities you may have perhaps diabetes or any kind of decreased kidney function. We talk about a strong nutrition plan. We talk about probably an exercise plan and possibly starting you on a medication. I would have a comprehensive treatment plan 
based on the years and years of experience and research that's been completed to determine these evidence-based guidelines for hypertension. My goal would be to improve your health outcomes. So using this published reliable data is something I do on a daily basis when treating patients. So I like to propose that we apply these same principles when making academic and programmatic improvements. Like our patients, we are thinking about how can we use this evidence and data as we make decisions to help our students. We want them to be successful clinicians, leaders, and educators. So I have three main learning objectives for you today. I really have three goals. I want you to understand the three A's of data-informed decision-making, and then I'm gonna present some real-world examples from our college. I really hope this will inspire you to think of some ways to utilize those three A's when you're making academic improvements, or if you're not in academia, this is an open forum, so if you're not in academia, you can even be thinking of some improvements you could make in your own professional arena. And then I'm gonna summarize benefits of utilizing data and creating that kind of culture in your college or profession. So I wanna pause here, and this is one of those opportunities I'm hoping you'll use your chat function, so please feel free to engage with me today. I want you to type in that chat function one or two words that you think of when I say the word data. What, are, what comes to mind? How does that make you feeling? What are your thoughts about data? So information, useful, research, use to inform decisions, facts, good, good. Quality improvement, research, assessment, research, great. So I can already tell by your answers that, that, that I'm speaking to a very scholarly group, right? Um, so a lot of times data, some of the, the thoughts that data can have for some people can be maybe there's too much data, there's too little data. Uh, sometimes it can be very time consuming to collect it or analyze it. I know that I've certainly felt that way at times. Um, and sometimes the format in which data is presented can be confusing, not user-friendly, but clearly this group already uh, sees the need for data and it can be useful, it can be used to make decisions, um, looking at the facts, quality improvement, assessment. So you guys are absolutely right, right on track. So at USU, we are dedicated to using this assessment cycle that allows for continuous programmatic improvement. The first step is assessment planning, and then it moves into that collect evidence and analyze data. Then you implement those improvements. You go back to that fourth step, monitor effectiveness of improvements, and then you're going back to that step two. It's a very circular process. For purposes of this presentation, I'd like to simplify this process a little bit further and describe what I call the three A's. And those are simply assessment, analysis, and action. And after you complete that action, it moves back to that assessment phase to see if your impl implementation worked. So let's go into these in a little bit more detail. So because I have a, a scholarly group here, um, most of you are familiar with the term spirit of inquiry. So I want you to think about something in your college or program that you think could be improved. I want you to identify that current state of the situation and if, if you have any current data sources. Do you have any actual reliable data on that topic right now? And what are some current forms of data that you could collect? So, for example, some of the student-focused um, data that we already collect are end-of-course surveys, some student uh, satisfaction, we always collect graduation rates, retention rates, but it could be something as simple as exam scores or some other kind of survey. 
And you'd want to be thinking, how can I use this? How can I make it user friendly? How does it pertain to what I'm doing, what, the situation I want to change? And what is needed to implement this new process? What kind of resources do you need? Is it manpower? Is it a new process? Do you need uh, technology, technology interventions? And then typically you would want to complete some kind of cost analysis to understand the risk and benefits. And then the analysis piece, you would have be looking at those artifacts, looking at the data instruments, looking at those findings and then making further recommendations. And that moves you into that implementation or action phase. And that's very simple, right? That's the implementation of that new process. And then as I mentioned before, you move back to the assessment phase to see if your hypothesis rings true. Based on all the data that you reviewed, you implement that action and then you go back to the assessment to see if that process worked. So I want, about a year ago, March 2020, exactly a year ago, is really when most school campuses were starting to close around the nation. And I know that many of you recall your own situation around this last time. Maybe your kids' schools were closing and your life changed dramatically. Maybe you were, um, started working remotely like we did. And so at that time, as I'm gathering my team to decide next steps uh, for the university, for our college, how we're gonna help our students, our USU students were also making some really big decisions. So I would like to introduce you to Randy. And he is a current family nurse practitioner student. He's nearing graduation. And as I'm getting the call from my daughter's school, Randy is making a really big decision to travel to New York City from San Francisco. And he's going to help his nurse colleagues help the COVID-19 patients. And in reviewing our population data, Randy is the perfect example of what our student population looks like. They are balancing being this frontline RN worker and taking care of their family and completing their graduate de degree at the same time. And so I'd like to share an excerpt of his email correspondence to our leadership team. Now remember this was back last April he wrote this in 2020. He states, I am protected. I purchased a full face shield P6000 face mask N95 respirator and protective jumpsuit from a local paint store back home before leaving. Unfortunately, the supplies are limited here and the nurses are asked to use their N95s for seven days. The straps do cause bruising and skin breakdown, but the fungal infections from the moisture are even worse. We've been working 13 hours a day for six to seven days a week. It's very traumatizing to see these poor communities where the hospitals are already stretched so thin. The local nurses here on average have about eight to 13 patients in the ER. It's truly unbelievable. I can't even have an, imagine having that many patients, especially with COVID. The nurses are very thankful to have us here and the community is very grateful. We're now in the beginning, we are now beginning to treat with blood plasma. It has shown promising results. Remember this was back in April of 2020. Our fingers are crossed that this works. We're all staying at hotels in Manhattan and our shift in and out. Sometimes the transit time is over two hours. The hardest thing besides the nursing care is having clean scrubs because everything is closed, including laundromats. So we've been washing our scrubs in the bathtubs after our shifts. Regardless of what you've been hearing on the news, it is still very busy here in New York City. The Bronx is especially busy with COVID-19 patients and the community is struggling to keep up. I was asked yesterday to extend my contract and continue to fight this monster. So I agreed and I'm scheduled here until July of 2020. The medical community here is expecting a second wave that will be stronger than the first. This is especially troubling because I've had several patients dying on me every single day. I hope the FDA approves an effective treatment soon. 
So here's Randy after working six 12 hour shifts in a row. And I share this story because this is just one example of what our students were going through this last year. And they were working daily, juggling between taking care of patients. And you can imagine, as we all know, the emotional toll of that alone, on top of caring for our family. Uh, most of our students, uh, according to our population data, are in their early 40s. So many of them have families and they're also attending graduate school um, with the clinical component. And so we really recognize at USC, we really recognize this last year the overwhelming challenges that face our students and our leadership team, our faculty continue to grow in their commitment and dedication to providing really compassion to our students and encouraging that student success. So back to March 2020, we quickly sprung into action. We knew we had to do whatever it took to help our students. We put together an emergency clinical contingency task force meeting. We had various departments. Uh, we know that this is, uh, we don't act alone, right? This was not a silo of the college. This was all departments from academic advisors to enrollment, to the financial department, to the registrar, to our office of field experience. Um, all of our faculty played a key role and our mission and vision was very simple to ensure that our students could progress in their nursing education without any delays. We assessed that students had potential to lose their clinical placement during this time. Sites, we knew sites were closing, preceptors were overloaded with patients. And so we knew students, we also knew students wouldn't be able to attend the on ground campus immersions which are distinctly linked to a course. So we quickly analyze all the data on how our boards of nursing um, and our accreditation bod bodies were responding to this crisis. We reviewed all of the new guidance and guidelines. So we knew what kind of potential variances we could propose in our programs. We also analyzed data on how many students were actually displaced from clinical. And we put in together a process of clinical accommodation approvals and how we could actually track all of this data we were receiving so we could determine a strong action plan. So based on that data, we determined for the action plan, we created very quickly, created virtual clinical hour options so students could continue in their clinical progression through the program. We transitioned our on-ground immersions to virtual immersions. And I'll speak about that in a little bit more depth. And then we removed concurrent requirements for clinical and didactic courses, meaning students could just continue with their didactic course if they were displaced from their clinical course. And throughout all of this, part of really a big piece of the action plan was to communicate. We held student town halls. We were answering questions left and right and really being able to communicate that action plan to our students, to our faculty and all of the stakeholders so that everybody knew that they were, our students were supported, our faculty was supported and how we were going to move forward. So we really created that notification and a formal process to track all of this data. So every eight week session, the team completed the 3A process to assess the data on how many students were displaced from clinical at the beginning, how many students were utilizing that virtual clinical option, and then constantly staying abreast of any new recommendations from our boards, our accrediting bodies to ensure we were right on track with really what, what they were recommending and what other schools were doing as well. And here we are a year later, and we just moved into phase seven. I can hardly believe that. We are moving into phase seven and of our clinical accommodation options, which has evolved into the options listed on this slide. And so even for the next phase eight, these options will change and evolve for the next session because we have a lot of clinical sites. Uh, most of our sites are now opening and hopefully, we're all hopeful that this is going back to some kind of normalcy um, for the, our clinical sites and our students. 
So the next uh, example that I'd like to share with you is um, how we utilize data and transformed our FNP immersion during the midst of a pandemic. Typically, our FNP students have four days of on-ground immersions during their health and physical assessment course. Our amazing, and I can't emphasize that enough, the amount of passion um, and um, drive that our amazing immersion team, they shifted to our virtual immersions creating a full schedule of all of the same events that students would normally complete on ground. And some of those events um, include, you know, learning clinical skills, doing demos of head to toe assessments and uh, evaluating standardized patients. And standardized patients are basically actors um, that are given a diagnosis and they present their symptoms to the FNP student and that student works with them, assesses them, and comes up with a treatment plan. So after each immersion, the directors employed a student evaluation. I'm going to show you an example of what that evaluation looked like and the data that we were collecting. So this is an example of, this is actually the last one that was employed to students. And it has five sections. And the first section talks about uh, the following statement. The following lectures or sessions were useful and expanded my knowledge. And it's based on a Likert scale from one to five, one being strongly disagree all the way to five being strongly agree. And typically we have a faculty name associated with each one of the lectures. And the students are able to evaluate the lecture and also allow for some additional comments, narrative comments after each section. So all of these are um, specific lectures that they're given. And most of these are worked through with a faculty and another um, patient. And so they can see exactly what that interaction looks like. We also include telemedicine and then a large portion of soap note writing. And um, that just means subjective, objective, assessment, and then plan. It's a very common soap note um, utilized in medicine. And then section two is very similar. It's still that uh, Likert scale from one to five, but it talks just about a little bit more specific um, information in lectures. A pediatric lecture, a well child breakout visit, and the breakout visits are very similar to debriefing. The well woman, well man exams. And then section three of five is guest speakers and modules. And they actually have standardized patients that work through a well woman exam and a well man exam with the students. Section four of five is really that overall experience provided knowledge on the areas of strength and weakness, clear idea of what they can do to improve their performance on future patient visits. And then we're always looking at the amount of content covered during that immersion was appropriate for the length, amount of time spent on the activity, and then sufficient information regarding time, date, supplies. And although that seems minor, it's actually very major in this type of event. If you can imagine our immersions, four day immersions have so many moving parts, it's very similar to um, constructing a, a con conference, a nursing conference. And so it's really important the way that we communicate with those students so that they are prepared when they get there on day one and, and during the actual immersion. And that's why we also ask questions. We've tried different forms of communication, such as Remind app and a schedule. And then section five, very simple, it's write in comments. So students are able to just very easily give any kind of narrative feedback. So in that analysis phase, uh, the immersion team collected massive amounts of data uh, after each immersion and were able to utilize that data to make changes. So they collected that feedback on those lectures, overall experience, the time on activity, 
and if the students felt like they had sufficient information moving forward into those immersions. And then, like I mentioned, the narrative comments as well. And this is an example of what that data is presented to when the immersion faculty and directors are reviewing it after each immersion. So this is um, one of the lectures and this faculty did a fantastic job. And so you can see that most of the students really enjoyed this lecture and felt that it was uh, beneficial to their knowledge base. This is very similar about the well woman exam useful to me as a beginning clinician. And then this is how we receive the data and analyze the data in the amount of content covered during the immersion being appropriate for the length of the immersion. So there was a lot of actions and continuous improvement uh, with these virtual immersions, but overall the results in this data of the virtual immersion was very, very positive. They did have an addition of an hour to practice the head to toe assessment and the students would actually practice while the faculty were the virtual patient. Uh, we included more individual and small group sessions. So each student had the opportunity to receive individual feedback um, and then added more time and concentration on soap note writing. Students were wanting some more experience and feedback on those. And the last one was the special population discussion. That was really developed very recently as students were requesting this content on how to approach these sensitive topics and circumstances in special populations. So the immersion team uh, was really able to utilize all that data after every single immersion to make small um, changes and fill in any gaps. So I'm going to transition now to FNP predictor exams and the assessment of this piece. Most of us have taken some kind of exam during our educational journey. Typically our exams are summative assessment on course objectives. But our FNP students undergo proctored predictor exams at different points in their program. The goal of these exams is to help them prepare for their national board certification exam that they take after they graduate. These exams are, common, are currently taken in pathophysiology, pharmacology, physical assessment, and then at their very last course, clinical residency. As a college, we were able to evaluate this data to see how our students are performing and retaining the knowledge during these courses. And based on that data, we've been able to employ different tools and resources for our students to help them learn difficult concepts. So here's a very specific example of what the student actually receives after they take one of these predictor exams. And so you can see here, the student did very well, greater than 70% on the top, the green has a high likelihood of success on certification exam. So this student did excellent. And what they would be looking for is areas of opportunity, right? Areas of improvement. And so this student with the 50 there, the red 50, they could look at eye, ear, nose, and throat and review that knowledge area so that they can improve in that before they take their national boards. And then this <clears throat> is an example of what we look at in the administration of um, how our students are doing in aggregated data. So these predictor exams <clears throat> were distributed, were started to distribute them in fall two of 2018. And you can follow somewhat, we don't really have cohorts, but similar students and cohorts follow through. So you can see that fall two of 2018 moves from 760 um, when they go to pharmacology, 763, 804, and then residency in 684. And it is important to note that um, until the fall of 2019, the residency exam, we were piloting that one. Um, and so it was not worth a grade in that course. But overall, this aggregated predictor exam scores are at or near national average, but we still wanted to provide more resources for students to be successful. So here was some of the action related to evaluating that data. We continue to have curriculum enhance enhancements. 
we know that um, medicine, f &P practice is constantly changing. Um, so we wanna make sure that we always have the most current recent evidence-based guidelines and practices in our curriculum. So we made some curriculum enhancements, especially in some clinical topics. We also hired a core faculty who emphasizes in student success. They work with those students one-on-one -on -one for those national board exams and remediation. She's also reviewed our curriculum several times to look at the um, blueprints for the national board exams against our curriculum to make sure there aren't any gaps. And then we've also implemented some new interactive learning tools and I'd like to share those in a little bit more detail with you. So the first one is Picmonic, and this one is a pretty recent implementation. We piloted it and got a great response from students and faculty, and so we have decided to implement it into the curriculum. And these are educational videos that utilize picture mnemonics. There's a lot of research behind this type of learning modality, and so we were really excited to implement this and our students are definitely utilizing it. Um, with our preliminary data, we've seen that students are really utilizing this platform. But I'd like to share an example of that for you. So this is just a very short video, but this will give you an idea of what the Picmonic looks like. Titus Media Assessment by the oats coming out of the ear of the assess man. Patients with this infection often have a red or bulging tympanic membrane, shown by the red bulge in the tin pan membrane. They may complain of pain, the pain bolts shooting into the baby's ear as he's pulling it down. Representing the infants will often be seen pulling at their ears if they have this infection. They may also present with a loss of appetite as sucking and chewing aggravate the pain. Patients may present with a fever, the fever beaver, and acquire an upper respiratory infection, or URI, the upper respiratory bacteria. This condition is more common in young children, shown by the young children gathering around, as their eustachian tube is narrower than adults, the ear radiostation tube that's narrowed. Chronic cases can lead to conductive hearing loss, illustrated as the musical conductor with plugged ears. Lastly, it is important to know that smoking increases the risk of getting otitis media, shown by the up arrow cigarette. So to review, otitis media includes assessment findings such as a red or bulging tympanic membrane, pain, pulling at the ear, fever, and the development of an upper respiratory infection. This condition is more common in children due to a narrower eustachian tube. Chronic cases can lead to conductive hearing loss, and smoking increases the risk of getting this infection. And so this tool also has a review section that students can review all of those concepts and then also a quiz function, they can test their knowledge. So we have also been um, investigating and looking at os osmosis. We've not implemented this yet but, we're, yet, but we're evaluating this one as well. And these are similar um, comprehensive videos, but these are more used for pathophysiology and pharmacology concepts. They also provide some flashcards, um, looking at that spaced repetition. And they also have quizzing and case questions to really master that material. So I'm gonna give you a short example of this one as well. And I'll just um, show a small excerpt of this video, not the whole thing. The ear can be broken down into three sections. The first is the outer ear, which is the part you see called the pinna, as well as the ear canal. Next is the middle ear, which is a tiny chamber that houses the tiny ear bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And finally, there's the inner ear, which has very special tissue structures called the cochlea, which converts sound waves into electrical impulses for the brain, and the semicircular canals which help with balance. Between the outer and middle ear is an eardrum, also called the tympanic membrane, so no air passes between the two areas. But the middle ear does have another possible outlet, called the eustachian tube, 
which acts like a valve connecting the middle ear to the nasopharynx. This tube has three main functions, equalizing pressure across the tympanic membrane, protecting the middle ear from reflux of fluids going up from the nasopharynx, and clearing out middle ear secretions. So those are just some examples of some of the new resource tools for our students. And those two examples would be very specific to the student who needed a little bit more information on ear, eyes, nose, and throat. She could read through those, um, go through those videos for studying to help her prepare for those national boards. So after assessing and analyzing those FNP predictor exams, we employed curriculum changes, addition of a specific student success, faculty support, and some interactive learning tools. What are the next steps? And it's very simple. We basically give it some time for that implementation phase, that action phase, and then we'll start the process over and go back to the assessment to see if that FNP predictor exam data improves even more after employing these interventions. So Sharika is a reminder that data can also ignite joy. I'd like to highlight Sharika Telford, who's a recent graduate from USU. She's been working as an R in the medical field for over 13 years, and she graduated in August of 2020 and just passed her national boards as a family nurse practitioner. She is a great example of how utilizing that predictor exam data, she studied the, the specific topics that were recommended to her and it can lead to these successful outcomes. So the final example I'd like to share with you today is how data can be used as a predictor for success in launching a new program. So in the assessment phase, we were looking at the Doctor of Nursing Practice program and wanting to propose that to increase our academic portfolio at USU. We knew that the DNP program aligned with our mission to provide that professional and personal education opportunities. We wanted that special outreach to our underserved groups. And so we reviewed accreditation, nursing organizational bodies and did that market research. So the college had already completed quite a bit of substantial research and market analysis, but we really wanted to know more uh, about our current population of students and if uh, what kind of data we could pull from them to see if this kind of program would be successful. So this interest survey was sent to our current MSN students and alumni the last couple of weeks of August in 2020. In less than two weeks, there were 281 respondents. And of those respondents, almost 33% indicated they had already decided to pursue their DNP following the completion of their MSN. An additional, almost 29% indicated they were highly interested. <clears throat> and almost 24% stated they had some interest. So overall, reviewing this data, we had almost 85% of respondents had some level of interest or had decided, decided to pursue their degree. So clearly our action from this analysis and this data was to pursue moving forward with a DNP proposal. And so I will certainly, as the, that progresses, I will keep you abreast of that situation. So creating that culture, how do we create that data-informed decision-making culture? And so I'm going to ask you to get back on that chat form, forum and ask, what do you think is needed to create this type of culture, either in your college or your profession? Good, so I'm seeing some answers. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. Flexibility, support for research, evidence-based practice standards, sure. Education.
resources, communication of importance? Absolutely. So um, some of my thoughts on this, and I, I have several of my own team members here today, so thank you for joining. And they can certainly pipe in as well. But I think that first, everyone must really feel safe to have that spirit of inquiry. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a place where you feel scared to bring up something that could be improved. Um, but certainly at USU, we hope that's not the case. We want you to always be looking, having that spirit of inquiry and feel safe to bring things to the table. And part of that um, data is having that daily conversation. So uh, I think most of my team would agree that it's not unusual for me to ask data or be talking about data. We have uh, weekly department meetings and data is uh, um, very commonly one of the topics and reviewing whether it's end of course surveys or student satisfaction or retention, um, our board pass rates, any of that kind of data, it's something that is more of a daily conversation. So it's not unusual when that request is there. And most, most commonly, um, especially our faculty will come uh, to the leadership team already having the data because they know that's gonna be the request. And so it's really having that conversation. The next thing I would say is having that shared vision and mission. I am blessed to have a full team that is full of passion for student success. And so when you have that shared vision and mission that um, we're gonna utilize this data and make these decisions because we really believe and the data shows that we can improve um, performance of our students or stu help our students be more successful and when that passion, that vision, that mission is there, it becomes a lot easier to utilize that data because we're all on the same page of what we want that final outcome to be. So in conclusion, hopefully hearing some of our college examples that I presented today sparks some spirit of inquiry in your world. I hope it encourages you to think about how the three A's can apply to you in your academic programs, in your profession. And I really encourage you to be the leader, be the leader in creating that data-driven culture if it doesn't already exist in your arena. So data does matter. If you don't measure it, you won't improve it. I have several acknowledgements. Um, it's really been my true pleasure to highlight all of the work that our college team has done in the last few years. None of these improvements, implementations would have been done without the true efforts of this team. Uh, I would like to specifically acknowledge these individuals as they specifically contributed to the initiatives discussed in this presentation. But please understand that we are very aware we couldn't do any of this with all of our, without all of our supporting um, departments, Office of Field Experience, Registrar, Student Services, Enrollment, Faculty Support, our faculty teams, uh, full-time faculty, and our adjuncts are very engaged. And so I have an acknowledgement list that um, pertains to this presentation, but it certainly takes a village to do a, complete a lot of these initiatives. So at this time, I'd like to entertain any questions. And I also left my email here on this last slide if you think of something after this presentation. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Thrasher. Wow, uh, Jennifer, what a great presentation. Um, something that excited me about that presentation was that it directly impacted students. And we had a different benefit of also impacting faculty behavior and faculty thinking, which I believe in the long run will always uh, be the better strategy for changing student uh, behavior and learning. So very good. I do have one question, Jennifer, um, just to kind of start off uh, the Q&A uh, section. And that is, um, what was the hardest part about implementing this, this model? Um, you know, I think that it happened um, intuitively because we were already doing it. And I think this last year with all of the changes that we immediately made, 
um, during the pandemic, it was very intuitive to utilize the data to make decisions. So um, I think that was just the impetus. I think we were already doing it. And then it just kind of brought it, the pandemic really brought forward that how much we actually are utilizing that data. Yeah, isn't it interesting how just common sense almost always uh, <laughs> exactly. you know, I have to go, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Billingsley? Jennifer, um, first of all, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, so much of what you talked about is, you know, the nursing process. And I think as nurses, we depend on that. But moving it into a more um, bigger realm, I think that might have been, was it difficult to get people onboarded with it? Or uh, were, since you're working with mainly nurses, was that kind of a natural process? It really was a natural process. And, you know, I, I as I articulated, I have a team full of passion for students. And so just having that, it was very natural. There wasn't any, hey, can you please come to this meeting? We need to figure out how to help our students during the, it, it was, when are we meeting? How can we do? Here's my ideas. Here's the data. Here's what I'm bringing to the table. Here's what I think we should do. Um, so it was really natural. And, you know, a lot of our faculty are also practicing so they could bring their real world experience to the table as well. So that was also very beneficial because they already had that um, viewpoint and really passion for the profession. I think nurses are kind of known for that as well. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. Anyone else? You can also uh, type your question into the chat box if you don't want to speak on the mic, but otherwise. Um, hey, hey, Kevin, it's Kevin. Oh, yeah. Hello? Sure. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, hi, uh, Dr. Bellingsley. Thank you for your presentation. This is Kenneth Oya. Um, I'm a part-time faculty um, at Aspen School of Nursing, but I also I work um, full-time as a nurse scientist at Denver Health here in Colorado, and a lot of my role is engaging, um, getting staff nurses engaged in this um, process that you're talking about, um, involved in research and evidence-based practice projects. Um, is this something that you, I mean, does Aspen have anything in place or are faculty expected to be engaging in these types of activities or is that the direction that we're going or is there like a person that does it, maybe educational research do you strictly through Aspen or? Kevin, did you want to answer that one? Sure, yeah, um, Dr. Oya, oh, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, at Aspen, um, part of what we do in order to kind of uh, incorporate what Jennifer was talking about, and, and it was basically the continuous improvement you know, model, um, we do have a, a system here at Aspen where every six months we have what are called data dialogues. And all of the faculty from a school come together, adjuncts and full-time, um, under, uh, you know, the, the leadership of the administration of that school. So all the deans and program directors and et cetera will come together and they will bring and share a plethora of data associated with student learning and satisfaction and faculty performance and goals that we have in, in relation to retention and, and et cetera. And through that data dialogue, it's a two or three hour um, event where it's a live presentation like we're doing now and everybody has an opportunity to contribute and to uh, process and to do what Jennifer was saying which is also analyze um, but it's looking at that initial data so the assessment stage too that, that Jennifer mentioned um, and using that data to then problem solve and plan a, a, a set of action plans um, that will then be implemented for six months. And then we come back and do another di data dialogue and look at where we've come in six months and is the data going in the direction we want it or do we want to um, alter it, something in our plan because the data may not be responding like we wanted. So uh, Kenneth, that is the is sort of the big picture answer that we do have this baked into our processes. Um, it's not as specific 
and narrow maybe as what Jennifer did where, where it was more so within certain courses and certain uses of technology during the immersions and these, and these additional multimedia tools um, and seeing that impact on you know, student satisfaction and et cetera. Um, but, but you know, as being part of one of the faculty, I'm sorry, you're actually on the, uh, the journal committee, um, that there are, uh, you know, a range of these kinds of, of sort of ongoing events where we're continuously trying to improve what we have here. And you're part of that continuous process by, you know, participating on those committees. And so um, within your school, I would say reach out maybe to your dean, which would be Dr. Uh, Nina Beeman, and she will present here today um, in about 30 uh, or 40 minutes. Um, but you can reach out to Nina and explain to her um, that you have some ideas, like Jennifer was saying, one part of this process is it has to be a safe environment for people to bring forth ideas and criticisms and concerns and issues that, that they want to improve. And you certainly have that safety um, within the School of Nursing and Health Sciences at Aspen to approach Nina for any of that kind of stuff. Um, does that sort of answer your question, Kenneth, or is there something maybe more narrow where faculty can be participating in individual studies to improve student learning? And we do have those options uh, in a different format as well. Oh, thank you. That helps answer, yes. Okay, very good. Anybody else have questions um, for Jennifer? I mean, you have an expert at your disposal right now for all of your questions associated with this. So I would, I would you know, uh, tap into her ear. If not, what I would like to do, uh, Jennifer, is just maybe summarize a little bit of what I was hearing as we went through uh, your presentation. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for such a impactful, organized, clear um, presentation that really led the, the audience and the listeners on a journey that to me was very informative. Um, I'm not a nurse by background, but I was able to understand everything you said, and, and that's, a, that's a craft of a good teacher. Um, and sorry in the beginning that I kept trying to call it data-driven decision-making. Um, that is sort of a term that's out there and it's been imprinted in my brain. Um, but I like what you have called it actually better, which is data-informed decision-making. And, and I think the informed part is, is, is makes us focus more on the analysis piece um, as opposed to just being driven by something, right? You've got to, you don't, you're not, you're not being driven by the data. You're actually the driver. The data is just informing you as you analyze. And I like that data informed decision making um, actually as a, as a better term. Um, also, I, I liked in the opening slide when you had as one of your objectives to inspire us, to, to, to get us within the profession of education um, to, to feel that we can make a difference and we can continuously improve our scenario if we actually have a model. And your model of the three A's, which were assessment, analysis, and action, I really like that. I mean, far too often we make things way too complicated and you see a whole range of all these fancy arrows and stuff pointing in all these directions and a hundred models that are out there. And yours just really hit, hit the nail on the head uh, and made it very understandable that we just sit down and assess the data. We then analyze it and come up with an action plan and implement that and then come back, analyze um, and assess and make more action, right? And that was sort of a little bit of the data uh, dialogue model that I explained for Kenneth earlier. But, but you also mentioned this spirit of inquiry and, and, and that it has to be a safe environment. And I just wanted to reemphasize that a, a little bit. I think another thing that, that makes a difference in the effectiveness of models uh, and actions off, often, and you hit it right on, on the head as well, which was you have to put it in writing. You have to make it public. You know, you can't just say it in a meeting and walk away. Um, something has to be documented, and, and that is part of what you mentioned, which is a shared vision and mission. If we're all talking about the same thing and we can see it, we're more likely um, to be successful. So uh, thank you for the real life applications as well. You know, when you were showing this model being applied within um, the immersions uh, during the pandemic. So a real life event caused us um, to have to modify slightly, and we just didn't do that randomly. Um, Y'all sat down and looked at the data and said, now, how should we modify this? 
Um, and then if we're going to modify this, let's make sure it works. Let's just not walk away and just assume, right? And so y'all kept coming back and, and assessing and analyzing and making more, um, making more adjustments and actions. Also, I, I, I like that video, um, how it was showing the multi sensory sort of way of learning about um, that one condition, uh, you know, where it was talking about babies get that condition and tympanic membrane. And uh, the interesting thing about that was it said it's a high, uh, you know, if you smoke, you're higher risk. Well, I guess that's another reason why babies shouldn't smoke, huh? But anyway, I will always remember the fever beaver now as a result of that and um, never forget that imagery. So I guess it works. Those are my big takeaways, Jennifer. Are there any closing comments that you would like to say to everybody about, um, you know, what you learned yourself from doing that model and then what you would say as they embark on trying to um, explore the use of that model? Um, I think, uh, thank you, Dr. Drescher. I, I'm glad you got some great takeaways from the presentation. Um, I really just think that you know, it's embarking on this with your team and sharing that mission and vision, like I said, that could just even be the stepping, uh, the beginning of it, right? And starting that um, shared vision that can lead into that spirit of inquiry and lead into that safety. In general, I think that this um, pandemic really brought our team a lot closer and it, it really encouraged us to communicate and talk more. And as I, ta as I said, utilize that data more so that we could make those good decisions. And so I think that's what I learned the most. I think there were a lot of um, negative, negative effects from the uh, pandemic and certainly a lot of challenges for our students. Um, but I do think there's also a lot of um, positive things that came out of this as far as academics in medicine, using telemedicine more, um, so we try to focus on those positive things and um, continue to collaborate as a group to make those decisions. There we go. And that's why she's the dean of a school, because she uh, brings people together and creates action and group unity. Um, so great job, Dr. Billingsley. Thank you for your presentation today. For everyone else, we hope to see you in about 30 minutes for Dr. Beeman's. And that will be our first day colloquium presenters. See you in a little bit. Take care. Thank you so much.